Jesus had to use metaphors. He, in, he had the, king, the understanding of the kingdom in him, but there was no uh, New King James Version or a New International Version of the Bible to use to preach the kingdom. So he used day-to-day -day examples. Uh, it's like somebody goes to the farm and plants a seed, and when the seed falls to the ground, it first dies and looks like nothing happened. You know, and then after that, a few days later, it begins to bring forth fruit. It says the kingdom is like that. So if we know how a plant, if a seed goes into the ground and dies, and then begins to bring up, pop up again, to spring up, then we can relate the kingdom of God, something in the kingdom, something about our identity, something about our inheritance in Christ, something about our journey in God, to that we can then say okay it's not the end of the world after all if it looks like i'm buried and finished because i'm like that seed that jesus was describing so he had to use those kind of examples so we can understand what we have who god is number one and who we are as a result of god's um creation of us god's design of us so consider it, let's consider redemption, the work of Christ that he did for us on the cross as a, a team sport, for instance. Uh, uh, redemption, or we consider it as a, as a group picture. I'm, I want to use those two examples. Team sport. There are, for instance, in a team sport, there are several individuals in a team. And sometimes they all play, like soccer and some other sport, like football. But depending on the sport, sometimes... There are some team sports that only one person plays at a time. Uh, for example, like chess, several individuals are in the team, uh, but only one person plays at a time. Sometimes they all play, depending on, the, and maybe it's another sport, but when it's chess, only one person plays at a time, you know? Uh, and then when he wins, he wins on behalf of the team. And everyone gets to be decorated with the medal. I was watching a video this morning when I was thinking about this, and I saw a video where a chess team of Russia won a championship. And they said, the, well, now the gold winner is Russia, and everybody shops, everybody's happy, everybody's excited, popping champagne, and you know, the whole frenzy in the atmosphere. And then you see 10 people come on the platform. And they have 10 medals already lined up, and then they put on the neck of each of them. They put on the neck of each of them. Now, when we look at the work of Christ as a redemption, as a as as a as a, like a, 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 a team sport, one person played, but we all got the medal. The same, and we didn't just all get the medal. We didn't get the medal in classes, the medals in classes and ranks. We all got the same medals, the same gold medal. The same thing was hung in the neck of everyone. Christ's victory then is our victory. The victory of Christ is my victory. The victory of Christ is Chica's victory. The victory of Christ is Dio's victory. You won when Christ won. <laughs> you became victorious, not, you are not becoming victorious today. You became victorious as at the time that Jesus went to the cross and rose again. Now, the problem we have is that we don't see, this is not so much, this is mostly to most Christians, head knowledge, not a reality in their hearts that they are living life by on a daily basis. Christ's victory is my victory. One of the things, write that down if you have to, and Christ's victory is my victory. Victory over what? Victory over sin is my victory. Victory over death is my victory. Victory over shame is my victory. Christ has conquered shame. You don't have any reason to be ashamed anymore because he conquered shame. Christ's victory over guilt is my victory. It's my victory. I have victory over guilt. I have victory over condemnation. I can stand up with my shoulders high in spite of all I've done because Christ has overcome shame. Christ has overcome guilt. Christ has overcome condemnation. He said in Romans 8 
there is therefore now no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ. So anytime the enemy tries to attack me with shame, whether through other human beings or circumstances or situations, I can stand firm and say, I am in Christ and his victory is my victory. I, he has authorized me to not be ashamed anymore in any situation, in any circumstances. His victory over shame is my victory. His victory over pain is my victory. His victory over condemnation is my victory. His victory over the world is my victory. I can spend that currency today, anytime, anywhere, at any moment, in any circumstances, because he already gave it to me. Okay, redemption Again, we say it's like a team sport. Let's use another example. Redemption is like a group picture. And what is a group picture? A group picture, like you say, when uh, you are in the class of 93, you know, and then you all take a photo, everybody poses, and then it's printed. That's it. Once it's done, it's done. And you are in the picture. So the beautiful thing about a good picture is that you can't undo it. Once it's done, it is done. You cannot undo a group picture. I have a picture of some, uh, we have a WhatsApp group of my school and they process some pictures from back then of the class of 93. I'm in the class of 93 and that's it. You, it's, it's already done. You can't undo it. So you can't say someone should not have been in the picture. They are already in the picture. Maybe this guy was not in SS3. He was in SS2. He just was just standing with his brother, and then they took the picture, and now he's in the group picture of 93 class. That's it. You can't undo it. What Christ has done and included you in, there's nobody who can undo it. What Christ has included you in as a, as, a, as a woman, as a man, nobody can exclude you from it. Nobody can reverse what Christ has done for you on your behalf. They might think you should not be there. They might think you don't deserve it. They might think it shouldn't have been for people like you. <laughs> but God wants you to know that he already included you and nobody can exclude you that he already included you in his plan and nobody can exclude you, that he already included you in his glory, that nobody can exclude you, that he already included you in redemption, the redemption work, redemptive work of Christ, that nobody he died for you and nothing can undo it. You are included in Christ. <laughs> My goodness. You are included in everything that Christ is, and everything that Christ asked, and everything that Christ has done, he did it with you in mind. He did it with me in mind. So I am just as blessed as anyone else because Christ, what he did, he did on behalf of all of us. My goodness. Wait. So he is, we are included. You are in the picture. Sometimes you just got to celebrate that you are in the picture. <laughs> my goodness. I'm in the picture. When I see myself, when Christ was on the cross, I was on the cross. When he went to the grave, I went to the grave. When he rose up from the grave, I rose up with him. And now I am just as victorious as Jesus because God had me in Christ through the work of redemption. You are in the process throughout. When he's paid the price, you paid the price. When he died, you died. When he rose up, you rose up. When he rose up victorious and sat on the right hand of the Father, he did it for you. Second Corinthians 5, 20 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, or new creation is a new creation, old has gone and new, the new is here. Now, take what, note of the phrase, in Christ. My goodness. You are just in Christ as much as, as uh, the water in this bottle. If I put a pen, throw a pen in this bottle, in this bottle right here, the, the pen gets in the bottle and there is nothing I can do. There is no stone I throw against the pen. It's got to hit the bottle. There is no, uh, um, 
nothing I try to do to the pain, I have to go through the battle because it is in the... Do you know what it means to be in Christ? You are embedded in Christ. God has put you in Christ. Christ becomes your holding. It becomes your casing. It becomes your shield. It becomes the, your protector. And you are living in his authority. So the scripture then says, when a man is in Christ, it almost, uh, you can almost rephrase it. You can rephrase it to say, when a man gets included in Christ, he is a new creature. What does it mean then to be included in Christ? There are, ways, there are two ways to look at Christ, at Jesus. You can look at Jesus as a man or as an institution or as a system. And over the years, we have considered Jesus as a man, uh, but it's also equally important to consider Christ as an institution or as a system. He's a man, but don't miss the point. He became a man for a reason. He wasn't just a man. Jesus was acting as, Jesus was God acting as a man because it was necessary to do that for the redemption of man. So God needed to manifest as a man because only man could pay the penalty for sin of mankind. It was going to take a man to pay the penalty for the sins that man commits. Doesn't the Bible say this, the sin that surely uh, sins will die? So it, it was going to take God, it was going to take a man to pay for his own sin. So the, what God did was to become a man so that man as an entity can be able to go to the cross and pay for his own sin because there are some things you can delegate or outsource there are some things that cannot be outsourced eating cannot be outsourced for instance nobody can eat on your behalf walking out and weight loss you can't outsource it Nobody can do that on your behalf. So Jesus has to get, he has to get in the skin of a man to pay the punishment that, a, that man deserved. He could not do it as God. He had to do it as a man. That way, man pays the price for his sin so that man can be redeemed. So he becomes one of us so he can have the qualification and the legal status to pay the penalty as one of us. God included himself in the system of mankind. He became one of us or he became part of us and one of us as a species so that our species can be re-included, can be re-included in the sphere of authority and domain of God. That changes everything because we are now part of him. So when he went to the grave, we went to the grave. He went to the grave on behalf of us. Christ is not just an ordinary man. He is a system, an in institution, God's institution of inclusion. And Christ then becomes a place for us in God. We have a place in God through Christ. So then being in Christ means we have the same status. We are co heirs we are joined here. Same identical blood, same identical righteousness, same identical power, same identical authority, and the same power. The Bible says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of me, lives inside of you. So we have been connected to Christ divinely, joined to Christ by God. And it's an inseparable connection. We have been joined to Christ by blood, and it was done by a blood sacrifice. The blood covenant is the highest form of covenant. It's not, it's not administered by the human court of justice. It's administered by a higher authority that even if men set you free, you're still going to be, be, be bound by the commitment to it. Because it's a, and the same way, if men hold you captive, if the son has set you free, you are free indeed. So if men don't forgive you or men hold your past against you, 
When God says, I've set you free, he has set you free. There's nothing anybody can do about it. Because in the realm of heaven's scheme of things, man, God sees man one. Now, this is a very important concept to understand. In hierarchy, in authority, in position, God said, let us make man in our image. On the scheme of things, man is a single entity. Angels looked at man and say, who is man that you are mindful of him? They are not talking about one individual and another individual somewhere. They're talking of us as, a, as an entity. God said, let us make man in our image. So in many cases, the Bible refers to man in singular, not plural. It's looking at it like this. If a man was not a single entity and a unit, then one man couldn't get everybody in a mess like Adam did. One man couldn't get everybody out of trouble like Jesus did. One man couldn't sin and we all sin. One man could not pay the penalty and we all paid the penalty. If man was not an entity. In one, in a, in, in, in a way we are like Aspen tree. If you know the Aspen tree, there are a group of trees that look similar in a forest. When you have time, look up the Aspen tree. There are a group of similar trees. You can drive 10 kilometers, 20 miles. You're going to see them all looking the same, all looking the same. Those trees are one individual organism in this root system. We all see on the surface, we see several trees, but really in the root system, they are all connected. They are just one particular plant. One, one individual. They can have, uh, a, they can, you can have thousands of offshoots. Glory to God, but one source. Thousands of offshoots, but one source connected to one place, connected to the same DNA, connected to the same genetic material. That is who we are in God, in Christ. We all have our connection to God, and our con your connection is independent of mine. Mine is independent of yours. So you have the same access to the root system that supplies the nutrients. You have the access to the same root system that I have the access to, that, your, that whoever, uh, uh, um, everybody else has the same access to. So in, in value, we are in the same eyes of God of the same value. Why is it important to know? It makes us know we are all equal before God. Because he sees us as one in value. He sees us as one in identity. He sees us as one in inheritance. He sees us as one in authority and privileges. So one person exercising dominion and authority over another person is not God's design. We may differ in responsibility and roles, but in his love, in status, in privileges, we are all the same in God's eyes. The same price for all of us. One soul didn't cost him more one soul was not more expensive than another. God didn't have to spend some extra money or extra cost on one soul more than another. Every one cost him the same. No man, he didn't get a special deal on any soul. The same penalty, the same price for every one of us. That's why the one soul is not, that's why the Bible says heaven rejoices over every soul. Whether it, is, it says, whether it is Beyonce or Beyonce or Jay Z that gets born again, or somewhere, somebody in the middle of somewhere that we don't, we've never known, one uh, somebody in a slum that nobody knows their name, they don't have Facebook followership, they don't have an Instagram account. It's, God sees us all the same. The inequality is man that we create is really is usually man made, not God made. The whole idea that of treating some people more special than others is more carnal than spiritual. We all have the same value in God, just different roles and responsibilities. We are one in God's design. We perform different functions, but we are all a unit. We have the same value in sonship, in inheritance, in blessings, in identity, a common purpose, different roles. And part of one purpose, which is to glorify God and bring him pleasure. We have been connected to Christ divinely by God. And we have been joined to Christ by blood. We were sealed with the seal of the Holy Spirit. And that seal, that, that covenant cannot be broken. We can't break it. 
it's because it was between God and Jesus. It was between God and Christ. We can, God then put us in Christ. The only thing we can do is we can dissociate from it, but we can't break it. We can break fellowship with it, but we can't break it. God was in Christ reconciling man unto himself. This was an arrangement between the father and the son. Man was only included as a beneficiary. It's not the one that can annul the contract. My goodness. What a wonderful thing that God has done for us. Christ is God's inclusion system. So then life in Christ cannot be an ordinary kind of life. That is the whole, the whole essence of all of this as I finish up is this. Life in Christ can't be an ordinary kind of life. Life in Christ is meant to be life on earth as though God himself was living here daily. And if you don't see yourself the right way, you'll be reduced to being a victim of all the imperfections that goes on in this earthly order. Whether it's in the world or in your church or in the, in the, in the world, whatever, you, if you don't see yourself the right way, if you don't have the right sense of identity of who you are in Christ, you're just going to be a victim of all the imperfections that all the human systems and everything that our imperfections have created, the, 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 the different narratives that our imperfections have created over the years. But that's not what God sees. When God sees you, he sees, he sees his work, the work of his hand, and he sees the value that he puts inside of you. I tell myself every day, I am who God says I am. I am what God sees. I may not be I may be seeing myself differently from how God sees me, but if we have to place how I see myself and how God sees me side by side, it's a missing part of the puzzle, but God's one is complete. So I have to go by this, not this, because this is missing some pieces. So you are not trying to be who God says you are. You are who God says you are. You just don't believe it yet. Life in Christ is not an ordinary life. It's a victorious life. We're not fighting for victory. We are fighting from. We are fighting and living from victory. Not living for victory, but from victory. The world doesn't tell us who we are. The world, we tell the world who we are. How we live, how we think, what we say, what we do. We are not responders. We are not consumers. We are producers. Many of us are not living in the reality of who we are and what we have in Christ. We are living a reduced life, a life of reduced privileges. Because of, we allowed ourselves to be defined by the systems of this world. By, by human frailties. By the way the world classifies people. Who is important and who is not important. Based on the things, based on carnal things. And whether it's from the world or from the church is the same thing because the church is full of the people from the world system. So the same propensities apply everywhere. It's like saying that the police of a nation is bad. The police was selected from the citizens of the nation. If armed robbers, like I was saying to Chicago this week, if you put a group of armed robbers to select the best, the, 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 the leader for themselves, they're not going to select a policeman. They're going to select the best, most successful armed, armed robber as their leader. And because we have common frailties as a, as a people in the world, we kind of build the same value systems around those frailties, around those imperfections, and we reward people based on that system. But God, see, God has a different measure entirely by which he sees us, and that's what he wants us to define ourselves by. When a man is in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are new. A life that's less than the quality of the price that was paid for it is not the life that God wants us to live. So stop living beneath your privileges. You are the head and not the tail. Look in the word of God and find who you are. Jesus in Luke, Luke 4.18 took Pick from the Bible, he picked the Bible at the age of 12. He read it from the book of Isaiah and says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has, cast, cast, he has asked me to cast down uh, up the brokenhearted and to declare the acceptable years of the Lord. A year of this is the acceptable year of the Lord. 
And the Bible, the Bible says he closed it and put it down and says, today is this scripture fulfilled in your eyes. That guy found himself in the world, in the world, not in the world. We've got to define ourselves in the word, not by the, what the world says. Stop defining your daily life. Start defining your daily life by the word of God. How, how's your day going to be? Awesome. This is the day that Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I'm not just saying the word now. That is my reality. That's my paradigm. And I'm not going to take any no for an answer. So when the devil tries to mess up with me at 11 a.m., I'm, 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 I'm reaffirming that, no, uh, you thought I'm going to be sad? Or uh, you think I'm going to be discouraged? No, devil, this is the day that the Lord has made. I'm going to put you to shame. I'm going to rejoice because the joy of the Lord is my strength. But my bank account is not my strength. The, work, the, the, the job that I do is not my strength. The, the, the news that I'm listening to on the TV is not where the source of my strength. It is the report of the Lord who says that uh, all things are working together for me, that I have victory, that greater is he that is in me, in, that's in me than he that's in the world. That is, that is, and that's what you're going to see. That's what you're going to experience. Start defining your self-esteem by the word. Don't let the world define your self-esteem. You are who God says you are. Start defining your identity by the word of God. Start defining your thinking by the word of God. God already defined you. Stop defining yourself by anything outside of what God says you are. So the gospel is a, it's all about identity. It's not about doing something or not, to do or not to do, no. We've, we've defined it on the narrative of conduct. We've defined it on the narrative of um, morality and all of that. All of that are included, but it really, it's all about identity. Because God does what he does because of who he is. God is not trying to become something. He already, he, he does good things because he's, he is good. He is, now, get this. He, he is not good because he does good things. No, he does good things because he is good. That's what we are who God says we are. So nobody really can de devalue me because it's not up to them. God didn't give anybody the login details into the system of heaven to, to change how much my, my wealth in the front of God. Nobody has that admin right. So when they express something that tends to devalue me, they're just exp expressing their opinion. Nothing to do. And everybody has the right to their opinion anyway. So, but they are not who, I'm not who they call me. No man really has the right to reduce another man. When anybody reduces you in your own eyes, it's because you allowed it. It's because you permitted them because they don't have that right. God didn't give that. God is not a co-signing uh, signer on the account of your identity and your worth with anybody. So why would we give people power to devalue us? If anybody devalues us is be, uh, and we agree with it, it's because we empowered them. We are who God says we are. Bottom line, nothing can change it. God is not going to change his mind. He's not about to, and he will not. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Can we just thank God and just bless him? Father, we thank you because we are who you say we are. Thank you because we have the value that you say we have. Thank you because we, we have been redeemed. And you have paid this price and it's once and for all. You don't need to repeat the process. It's done once and for all. You paid the penalty once and for all. So we are as accepted as we are ever going to be. We thank you for that. We are, we are as, uh, as loved, uh, as as we are ever going to be loved. You cannot love us more than this because you already loved us as much as you are ever going to love us. What we need is a divine understanding of this and the strength, the confidence, the boldness to walk as though we know we are loved by God. Every day of our lives, living it in victory as one who knows their place in Christ.